These are dark times. For some of us, they always have been. Yet there is resilience in our places, wisdom in our streets, the desire to resist, to care, to be together again. We can harness this critical moment. Our stories of ruin, resistance, and renewal will light the way forward. Join us at the SF Urban Film Fest. Good afternoon and welcome to the seventh annual SF Urban Film Fest. Uh, my name is Faye Darmawi and I'm the founder and executive director. Our mission at the SF Urban Film Fest is to use film to inspire conversation and action around urban issues. In addition to Gristal, who I'll bring onto the stage in a moment, our SF Urban Film Fest core team includes Ron Sundstrom, humanities advisor, who will moderate the panel today and also our program producers include Robin Abad, Omid Menacheri, and Susanna Smith. I would also like to give a shout out to marketing guru, Hannah Moore, and also thank you to all our volunteers. And now I'd like to bring Crystal onto the stage. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Chelik. I'm the festival manager and curator of today's program, Crisis of Care. I hope that you got the chance to watch Dreamhood um, on our website, which which provides important context for this conversation. You can access the film with your pay what you can rental pass until this Sunday. Now I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement that was gifted to us from the American Indian Cultural District in San Francisco. We acknowledge that we're on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatish Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatish Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as, as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their ancestral homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatish Ohlone people, and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. 
We're presenting this land acknowledgement to promote visibility for the Rama to Shaloni and all American Indians who are living and thriving today on their ancestral homelands. Our panel will begin in a moment after a few announcements from Faye. Thank you, Crystal. First, I wanna let everybody know that today's program is being recorded. Um, and I also like to thank you in advance for our patience as we know unpredictable things may happen as we're all still getting used to virtual events. Please leave a message in a comment box if you have any issues today. Um, special thank you to our members joining us today. Um, if you'd like to keep our community growing and become a member, it's easy to do so via our website. We're gonna drop that link in the chat. Our festival this year is pay what you can so that all can access our programs. If you'd like to donate and support that effort, your help will keep this offering possible by offsetting our costs. Again, we'll drop the donate button in the chat. Um, lastly, for me, please fill out a quick survey using the link on, this, on the screen or, or the link in the comments. It's important that we get as many survey responses as possible to understand who we're reaching and make sure that we're serving our diverse and wonderful audiences. And now I'd like to turn it over to Crystal. Our festival's theme this year is Wisdom Lives in Places because we were all thinking a lot about how for many of us, 2020 was a year of rediscovering or finally recognizing lessons from people in places that really have always been available. One such thing was the idea of mutual aid. It was the first time I had heard the term mutual aid, but not the first time I had practiced it. And more importantly for many communities, mutual aid has been critical for survival for generations because systems of care failed or were absent altogether and often replaced in fact by systems of harm. Mutual aid is a beautiful way to live in connection, acknowledging our interdependencies and taking care of our neighbors while allowing others to care for us. But at the same time, it's a time consuming, exhausting way to live long term. Why do we have to do mutual aid? More importantly, which communities have relied on mutual aid for survival long before COVID? Which systems are threatened when we the people facilitate care for ourselves? Who benefits? And what might a coordinated, sustainable, equitable solution look like? With that, I'll remind you to please interact with us and the panelists by putting your thoughts and questions in the chat. And I will turn it over to Ron Sundstrom who will introduce our panelists. Hello, thank you, Faye and Kristal. I am Ron Sundstrom, the Humanities Advisor for the SF Urban Film Fest. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today, be part of this program, and introduce to you our wonderful set of panelists. First, there is Cheatham Slankard. Cheatham Slankard is a filmmaker originally from Turkey and currently based in Cleveland, Ohio. She's the director of Dreamhood and an assistant professor at Cleveland State University. Next is Gloria Berry. Gloria is an SF native, founder of Berry Powerful, Powerful Ladies, activist and local politician, currently serving for San Francisco's Democratic County Central Committee. Next is Mark Mulner. Is, uh, Mark is the director of volunteer and community support services at the Shanty Project in San Francisco and former co-chair for the San Francisco HIV Planning Council. So welcome everybody. My first set of my first question is for the whole panel, and it's this: What, in fact, is mutual aid? You know, it's a great idea, and how do we practice this idea? How do we practice mutual aid? First, I'd like to direct this question to Chida. Thanks, Ron. Um, Mutual aid is often, um, you know, it's a form of aid, right? And um, often it's defined as opposed to charity. Um, so for me, I think the most important defining characteristic of mutual aid is the fact that um, the community decides what it needs um, and the community decides how that need should be met and they come together and everyone contributes. There's giving and taking that's happening at once. Um, you know, I think that this form of um, aid and this form of support has been uh, a part of human existence uh, probably at all times. Uh, but looking at it critically um, in desperate times and dire circumstances, I think that we um, you, we can sort of look at it more critically. Um, I think for me, the most important element of it is this agency, the fact that the community has agency as they decide 
what the need is and how it should be met. The fact that they become part of the decision-making process. I think that's one of the most important aspects of mutual aid. Great, thank you. Um, Mark, how would you answer that question? In some ways, pretty similarly. I think uh, mutual aid, is, it's, uh, it's been with us for forever. Um, and it is hard to quantify. You know, it could be forms of practical support. It could be uh, uh, helping people emotionally. I think a, a key part of uh, mutual aid is really the the word mutual, uh, in in which a community is uh, is helping itself, and other communities are also helping other communities. And in that process, uh, people are learning from each other uh, and providing bi-directional kind of support, uh, rather than a support that is. As Cheetah mentioned, uh, could be considered simple charity. Uh, it's a way, I think, for everyone involved to grow as human beings. Nice, nice, fantastic. Gloria? Yes, um, mutual aid for me is, is almost common sense, or at least it should be. It should be something, the natural thing to do. For example, today I read an article where we all know about the horrible weather in Texas. And there was a delivery driver who brought some steaks to a couple that uh, ordered them for Valentine's Day. Her car got stuck in the snow. And the lady was stuck. She was calling for a tow truck. She tried to get it to a hotel. And the people just was like, no, you're staying here with us. And she ended up staying there five days until the weather cleared. So it was just something that should just naturally be when you consider everyone your brothers and sisters. Fantastic, fantastic. You know, this, the film that we got to see for uh, this panel is amazing. What stood out, right, for each of you um, in that film? So, I mean, I'll, I think I'll, I'll start with in the natural place. Uh, Cheatham, what stood out for you in this film? Um, like most films, it was an amazing experience to make this film. Um, of course, we always make films because we want to tell a story specifically to an audience, and it's most rewarding to be able to do that, like in the context of this festival. But there's also this creative element, this human element for a filmmaker who is behind the camera, um, you know, putting forth the story, all the people that you meet, all the things that you learn about that story, the people who are involved with it. It it absolutely enriches the person behind the camera, in this case, me. So um, even if the, the film that I made never found an audience for me, it, ha it, it would have been a win. So that's uh, very, very important. And I think in this context, what I'll say about what's most striking about the film is uh, the sort of mutual aid slash community aspect of it. Um, I think that the film was made by support from this great community, um, bringing diverse voices, bringing a lot of um, characters to the screen, weaving their stories together to create a coherent narrative. And um, I think that sort of fits. In fact, in the beginning of the film, uh, in the beginning of this process, I had some concerns. I thought maybe it would be a more successful film if, I, if we had one central character and followed their story from beginning to end. It just wasn't the film that we made. It was everybody's story coming together, viewing together. And I am happy with the result. But um, to sum up, it is that um, community engagement, involvement, this communal story that's woven together, I think, is one of the um, striking elements of the film for me. Well, I love that answer. The, the, the idea of mutual aid wrapped up not only in um, the form of the film, but also in the format of the film. That's really great. Um, Mark, what stood out for you in the film? There's a lot that stood out. I mean, I think for me personally, uh, Art's story uh, and his uh, emotional attachment to the uh, the gardens and, uh, and the space recreation um, really hit in a beautiful way. Um, as far as for the agency that I worked with, I, I couldn't help but make a connection between, I'm forgetting the names, unfortunately, the factory owner and uh, the worker who had such a, a a large story as well. You know, uh, Shanti started by matching uh, peer support volunteers with clients with cancer, with HIV. And we always wanted to make sure that there wasn't that element of charity, someone coming in and dropping off stuff and then just exiting and no actual mutuality happening, no actual connection happening. And so watching them sort of learn from each other, in particular, watching the factory owner learn about all of this life and all of this life, you know, left to live as well. 
was really beautiful for me because it really uh, models what, what we at Shanti try to do, which is to try to connect people who may be very, very different in a way that someone is certainly supporting the other person, but there is a mutual connection where they're learning about each other's lives, uh, where they're perhaps getting educated on different things that they might never have considered. Um, and they leave, if they ever even leave the relationship, um, richer uh, from learning all of that. Fantastic. Gloria. Yes. Um, and, and again, I want to thank everyone for having me on this panel. But um, I actually took notes so that I wouldn't forget. So I'm going to um, look at them a little bit. But um, what stood out to me at first was the councilman. He, in some ways, he triggered me. But I, I, I had to actively listen to what he was saying. And, and in other ways, he inspired me. I think it was fascinating. And um, Cheatham, I'm, I appreciate you doing the different, uh, the story of different lenses through the different people. Because if you would have stuck with them, I'd have been like, ah, I don't know. But however, I was fascinated that he was assigned that district as punishment. That oh. people thought that that would be uh horrible but yet his background which i'm glad he expounded on was that's how he grew up so it wasn't a big stretch for him and then i was really impressed when he mentioned the forgetful of genocides mm -hmm. the forgetfulness of it because um i think america does get very forgetful and then another person who touched me i think probably it's going to touch what he said touch my heart as far as what he said for the rest of my life is the man from the Con I mean the woman from the Congo who said that to to speak up and don't regret your silence I that was so profound of a statement um I live in that and I never thought of it that way but to, I, I know there are those times where you wish you would have said something and you regret you didn't mm -hmm. she she nailed that and then um I was also interested in um, my Yale when they said it's the housing and that the landlords just pretty much care about getting money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the failure of this country at this point. And then um, I was interested in more information on how when they redeveloped the houses there that were considered blight, that's a trigger word for me because mm -hmm. they re redeveloped my whole community based on that word, mm. but they didn't include us in it. Um, but they said they had trusted network, I mean, excuse me, trusted contractors and developers. And to just think that there's actually some that are trusted that exists, that that was good to hear. Thank you. That's fantastic. Love that answer. Okay, this one is for the producer director, right? for Cheatham, right? Um, what, um, how did you come to this story, right? Uh, what led you to it? Um, you know, what brought you to it? Yeah. It's an important question. I think the genesis of a project, the genesis of a creative idea, um, I think it, it matters. It matters how we were, you know, what, sparked the idea at the first place. For me, like I've lived in Cleveland for 12 years now, and um, I heard about the story, I think from the newspaper, um, you know, I was interested in it. Um, and um, I think I had this, uh, but I've always been interested in issues about space and place, this idea about how we define home, uh, what mm -hmm. home means, you know, mm -hmm. when does a place become home for someone? Mm -hmm. And I have this personal connection to that story because I'm an immigrant here and I defined my home here mm -hmm. in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And um, I also grew up with um, stories of displacement because um, I'm the daughter of a refugee family. My mother was born in a refugee camp in Austria mm -hmm. in the 1940s. Um, you know, as a Crimean Tatar as a family. So I, I grew up with that. I think uh, maybe in my psyche, there is this question of, um, you know, just this, this uh, desire to explore the ideas of belonging, ideas of being from one place, ideas mm -hmm. about defining what home means. Mm -hmm. And on top 
top of that, I do have this um, strong interest in housing um, as a human right and mm -hmm. um, and what that means for our cities and for our communities. So there's this, you know, creative process is magical in that way. You know, there are things that lead you to stories, this thing that I shared about my um, my own personal background. But then there are these political and um, more um, sort of overt um, interests that one has and they somehow come together and draw you to a specific project. In this case, I think it was a combination of those two things. I love that. I mean, you, you strung together there the ideas of space, of place, of home as distinct from housing, the need and the right for housing um, the, as, as a connected to this desire and the need for belonging community. That was a that's a that's a, a beautiful answer. Now, let's let's swing back to all the panelists, right? Um, uh, Gloria brought up these concerns uh, about the developer, for example, and um, highlighted some of the amazing comments from the participants in the film. I love that, right? Um, and, and in, Gloria, your mention of the developer, you, uh, you, 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 you brought up some concerns. And this, this connects to my next question, right? About the role of the, of the public and the private in these projects, right? What is the role of private and public partnerships in mutual aid? So um, I'll go ahead. I'm going to start again with uh, Cheatham and then go to the rest of the panelists. So Cheatham. Great. Um, and I, I would like I, I loved um, Gloria's answer earlier when she started sort of giving these examples from the film, these um, statements that um, our you know, people in the film had made. And it really draws um, one's attention to the familiarity of the story. You know, mm -hmm. it's a very local story that takes place in this neighborhood in Cleveland, but it is um, an American story. It is mm -hmm. not unique to this space. These are mm -hmm. issues, stories that exist throughout this country. And I think um, it's really great to um, point uh, that out. And to talk about, uh, to get to the specific question of, you know, what is the place of private versus uh, public in mutual aid? Um, so in the very first question, I talked about mutual aid and its importance, like the the fact that one has agency, right? It is not charity. The community has control uh, over what is done, how it's done, and who participates. Um, so I think um, that aspect is very, very important. However, in the case of International Village, this neighborhood that we're looking at it in, in Dreamhood, um, it is a struggling neighborhood. It mm -hmm. has lost some population. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the population that lives there um, lives uh, in, with limited or perhaps low income. And so the presence of, um, you know, community partners really helps uh, the community and elevates the level of aid that's there. Um, but that is, in this specific example anyway, in International Village, um, that's done in a, um, you know, in a very effective way, I think, because the, it's structured uh, like this. Uh, so the community has block clubs. So mm -hmm. if you live on a street, that street has a block club and mm -hmm. they would meet maybe once a month or so. Mm -hmm. There's a block club leader, there's a secretary, you know, there's a, they have these events. And in those block clubs, people bring uh, up uh, their concerns, um, their needs, and then uh, there is this effort to provide solutions to that. So there's the block club and then there's the community uh, organization, Metro West, it's mm -hmm. called. So, th you know, those the people who work in Metro West don't necessarily live in that neighborhood, but their priority is to work with the residents. And so Metro West, the community, community organization then can make and does make uh, connections with other community partners. It might be big city organizations like Cleveland Housing Network or the school district or other um, nonprofit organizations uh, to address the specific needs that the community themselves, you know, individuals from the community brought mm -hmm. up. So I think that in this case that model seems to work because it brings more resources to the community um, and ultimately sort of um, elevates uh, the amount of uh, resources that can be provided. Uh, but mutual aid is, um, you know, it exists and is very strong in this community. And um, I don't want to go over my time here, so please <laughs> tell no, me to no, stop no. if I'm going over. No, this is great. What you're doing is you're teasing out the benefits of these partnerships as well as the concerns, right? Mm -hmm. So please, um, Actually, I want to push you a little bit on this answer, right? Um, who started those block clubs? That's a good question. I don't know the exact answer, um, but um, uh, I think um, 
my guess is that it started with art, uh, the character that we see, because he, he did take on a very distinct leadership role in the community simply because he was fed up with the state of his neighborhood. It, he didn't feel safe mm -hmm. and he didn't want to live in a dump. You know, he wanted to live in a nice place. He had always lived in this nice neighborhood and all of a sudden his neighborhood, not all of a sudden, but gradually. And at some point his neighborhood was one that he didn't recognize anymore. And he wanted to do something about it. Um, and art is someone who has, um, you know, clear leadership skills, right? He was in the Marines and he means that he's a community leader. So he's the one and he talks in the film uh, in detail about how he started this thing is like, I was, you know, he was buying the uh, plants that he was planting and turning empty sort of um, blighted sort of lots into community gardens and getting other people to help him. And then community partners started getting involved and essentially providing him support you know, more funding to make more gardens and, um, you know, hoop houses where, you know, they're not only relying on outdoor, but they can start um, growing things earlier in the spring. Uh, they can start planting things. So long answer to a short question, who started the block clubs? I don't exactly know the answer, but in this specific case, in Art's case, I know that he had um, played a strong leadership uh, role um, in the story of this neighborhood. Well, well thank you, thank you, thank you. Of Next, course. I'm gonna to swing to Mark. Mark, Rick, how would you answer this question about the role of private and public partnerships and mutual aid, especially aware of the, the mixed benefits and the concerns of those, about those partnerships? I think mixed benefits is a pretty good phrase, a loaded one, mm. of course. You know, uh, ideally, communities can support and, and uh, sustain themselves, right? That's in some ways like a classic liberal idea. It's even a classic libertarian idea that a community uh, uh, rallies around itself um, and lifts itself up and uh, and everyone moves forward um, ideally. But th the thing is we're not living in an ideal world. And so there is a, a certain responsibility that, that needs to be needs to be seen. The you know, the fact of the matter is that many communities are, are facing challenges that they did not bring on upon themselves. Um, and so they should not necessarily be responsible solely for, for, for fixing those problems. Those problems could be so many different things. I mean, it could be as basic as living in a capitalist society, right? There are so many different ways that communities and individuals can be impacted by outside forces. And so as challenging as the idea of private or public, and to me, those are quite different. Um, uh, being a, a big part of mutual aid, I also think it's a, it's a responsibility. Um, but you know, with that responsibility comes a lot of challenges because there's competing agendas and there's com there's competing goals. You know, and goals change. Goals change a lot of times based on public outcry or what's hot now. Mm -hmm. um, but for something to be sustainable, all three parties have to be involved. The community centralized, absolutely. In many ways calling the shots, defining their needs, and also supporting and helping themselves. But people have lives, and sometimes they those lives can interfere with their ability to provide necessary levels of support. So it's important to have those partnerships, as long as they're, they're, they're true partnerships, mm -hmm. um, in which guidance and the community itself are being centralized. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it becomes a, a, a kind of a push me, pull you of well, what is what is the virtue that I want to signal right now by helping out this particular community mm -hmm. or this particular item. Um, and so it's it's not an easy uh, question to answer. It could be impossible. Uh, the only thing that I'd say is that all three parties have to be involved and the community itself always has to be centered. Nice. Community centered, community led, um, mutual aid. And the dance that you mentioned there is, is really interesting. And the constant worry about virtue signaling, certainly. Gloria, how would you tackle this question about the role, the role of public, private and public partnerships and mutual aid? Unfortunately, um, I think there's a, a, a problem. There's a block. And um, I was listening to former presidential candidate Marion Williamson and Dr. Cornell West today. And what they're basically saying is in politics, morals are no longer there. So if we want public, which is the public government and private, which is all these huge corporations and the community to work on solutions together somewhere, somehow morals and humanity 
have to be brought into the conversation. And um, I, I have a, a, a terrible example of how um, I saw the clash of such a, a, a conflict. And that was last year when we first sheltered in place. San Francisco was the first city in the country to shut down. So COVID-19 would not spread rapidly. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that came into my mind was, well, what, well how are the homeless going to shelter in place? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So me and my, um, one of the groups I belong to called Beds for Bayview, we set up a tent encampment in a park where people weren't allowed to do recreation in the park. Oh. But we said, well, why can't we set up tents six feet apart? Mm -hmm. So half of the people got kicked out of the shelters would have somewhere to go because they reduced the shelter size with mm. no solution of where those people should go except onto the street. Mm. So we set up that camp and the city shut it down. Mm. So we went back and we set it up again mm. <laughs> and they shut it down again. And we told everybody, we so told social media and they spread that word. Of, this is what the city was doing to people. And would you know, today we're the standard of how it should be ran. And they have safe tent sleeping sites all over the city. Um, of course, we like everybody in the hotels, but it's sad that we had the, the community and a private organization had to push and push and push for people to be cared about, you know, so. The answer is more morals and compassion and integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, you speak in my language, Gloria. I'm a philosopher, right? <laughs> that's that's how I pay the bills. And um, so I teach ethics and moral philosophy, and I'm really interested in bringing uh, the moral and the ethical angle back to policy discussions, policy questions. And I love the I love how you answered the question, because you show us that it's not just the dual role of the public and the private. It's also it's the it's the it's the civil service. It's the civil it's civil society and part and the private sphere and the public sphere. And sometimes you're not just pushing back on the private. You're actually pushing back on the public sphere. Right. To get them to act right, <laughs> to do the right thing, you know. And so that's a, a really amazing story that speaks to the benefits of the partnerships, but also many of the hazards. Right, so that's that's fantastic. So, um, how about a practical question for the panel? If I can actually jump go in, ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. One, please. A bit of a, a follow up there. I think Gloria reminded me of a, of a key danger. I, I think when it comes mm. to uh, these partnerships, that in my opinion, still they absolutely have to happen, is that there's often a focus on on this intangible called what is quantifiable. Oh um, yeah. And so, that's a problem. Quantifiable. Uh, doesn't often in, in, include uh, emotional needs. It doesn't mm -hmm. often include what the community itself has said works for them. You mm -hmm. know, and, uh, if the focus is is purely on what are these measurable outcomes? What yeah. are these actual goals we're going to get at the end of this day? You're actually missing out perhaps on unquantifiable things like isolation or how does a, how does a community actually feel empowered? Not how an outside entity says you should feel. Right, right. No, no, that's great because the metrics of the, the evaluation, the assessment metrics run, <laughs> run a lot of the a lot of these projects. I mean, they, they run my life in education. Right. And so but who gets to set these outcomes? Do the outcomes come from the community or do they come from the private side? Right. That's funding the projects. Or does it come from the public side? Right. So it's important to center the community is what I keep on hearing. And don't forget those outcomes. Right. So, Mark, is there resistance to that? I want to follow up on your follow up. Do you find resistance to uh, the, the demand to reset those outcomes? Yes, of course, but it's a soft resistance. You know, it's also an understandable resistance. If people are putting money in, then they feel that they should have some say in how that money is spent. And that's across both public money and private money. So I totally understand it. But at the same time, it does create barriers. If a program's focus is on how can I impress enough this particular funder, government or private otherwise, then that focus then again shifts away from what the community is saying it needs to how can I continue to get this money year after year. Nice, fantastic. So let's shift to a more practical question, right? Right. 
why do we have to have a to do to engage in, in mutual aid, uh, mutual aid? Why do we have to have right a to do right to engage in mutual aid? How do we get this started? Right. Um, Cheatham. Uh, yeah, I think mutual aid makes our lives better, uh, both um, on both sides of the equation, uh, helping, giving and receiving. Um, how to do it is the tricky part. I think mm -hmm. that as someone who's grown up in a different country, um, I am amazed by the community organi organizing that I see in the United States. That was new to me. I did not grow up, grow up with that as part of Turkish culture. Uh, there's, of course, a community that helps one another, but it's usually not organized in the way that um, you see here. So I think that uh, community organization part of it is key. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, mutual aid gives people agency but then how do you really do it right where mm -hmm. do you pop up the free little library or who makes it who knows that it's there mm -hmm. um, or I think there are these community fridges or mm -hmm. like um, you know food sharing areas that um, you know people could contribute to and mm -hmm. receive things where do you put them so the organ mm -hmm. or organizing part of it I find fascinating and it's um, in my experience, it's been effectively um, realized. I think that social media is a big part of it. Um, mm -hmm. People playing leadership roles like art uh, that we see in the film is important. Uh, but um, in the example of the film, we see uh, things becoming, um, you know, more, um, what's the word? Like, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really want to say legit, but I just did. Uh, mm -hmm. Things becoming more organized, getting, giving a name, you know, people working for that community organization piece of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't do things single handedly. They work with the community. There are volunteers and it's that community buy in is very, very important. Not sure if that's an exact answer to your question, but that's what I have to contribute about how do we do mutual aid. I think by stressing the importance of agency, participation, leadership, um, um, and uh, the, the organization aspect of it. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it was, it was a, it's, a, it's a difficult question. The, why do we have to have a to do? But and we also just need to ask, right, what do we have to do to, to engage in this stuff? And, you know, and I'm hearing and, and we all need to understand that this is not something you just pop into casually. It requires some organization. And definitely, as we heard from Gloria and Mark, uh, listening to the community, right? Real community engagement rather than bringing your own agenda. So, Mark, how would you answer that question? Right. So, um, right. What do we have to do to engage in mutual aid? I mean, this might sound kind of bleak, but uh, mutual aid usually starts because of an emergency situation where uh, something terrible is happening to a group of people. And so on a human level, uh, people start to support other people. Uh, we mm -hmm. saw the support for the AIDS crisis starting in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was not necessarily supported by uh, supporting people with HIV was not necessarily mm -hmm. seen as a goal by uh, all sectors of government. So what we saw were people coming together, a community forming that needed to help itself and a community forming with that community of people who wanted to help these challenged communities. Both those communities come together um, because of emergencies. Obviously we're seeing that in Texas now. We're seeing that all the time it's a, it's a human thing. Um, but to sustain that, I, I do think that's why we have to have that these ongoing partnerships. People get tired of having to spend their lives in an emergency kind of mm -hmm. basis. So to sustain that kind of work, it has to be a combination of mm -hmm. something that is sustainable, whether it's an agency or whether uh, it's a, a, a little a particular arm of the government or whether it's a even a, 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 an arm of a private corporation, but it can't just rest there. It has to continually have those volunteers, those people coming to do this because they want to do that. But because no mm -hmm. one can be everything, it has to be all of those different things to allow people to come in and out if they're volunteering. And it, during those downtimes to make sure the efforts are sustained by actually funded agencies or arms of the government. It's, it's, it's too complex really to give a, 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 a snap answer. No, that, that's great. I mean, um, you're pulling us, it's, we should be pulled away from just being in the reactionary mode, reaction, reaction, uh, engage in reactions to emergency, but we need to, we need to, to, to be ready for those things and listen to the community. Um, and, but to have an ongoing conversation is what I hear from you, right, Mark? 
Exactly. I mean, we saw that just last year with the, when the pandemic hit the U.S. You know, in many ways, uh, our government, to say the least, was not prepared. Um, however, that doesn't mean that emergency efforts didn't suddenly pop up, that people were not willing to really just do what they needed to do to help, say, seniors who were sheltering in place or adults with disabilities who were having mobility challenges. Uh, my agency had a flood of volunteers of people who heard that they uh, that there were these big needs, um, and even though they were also living in a crisis mode, that they still wanted to help. But to sustain that, you can't have the expectation that the community itself has sole responsibility. Mm -hmm. That will potentially harm that community if they are constantly having to fix themselves. In fact, the whole word fix is, is problematic it's itself. It's very problematic, right. yeah. Good, good. Gloria, how about you? What do we have to do to engage in mutual aid? That's actually a really difficult question for me because <laughs> it's, it's almost like, how do I convince a Karen that what she did was racist when she called the police on an innocent person? It, it's 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 something that a lot of it, in my mind, should be innate. You know, I remember as a child, you know, going to convalescent homes and spending time with elderly just because I knew they were lonely. And it's just something in my heart to do. So how do you get people to have a heart? I really don't know. We in San Francisco have the most billionaires than any city in the country. We have 73 billionaires. And it's like, how do you get these people that have to walk over the same human feces that I do to care about not tracking that in your house, to, to get people that shop at the Saks Fifth Avenue and all these, these fancy stores, and then to come outside and have to step over a body sleeping on the sidewalk, it's like, mm -hmm. how do you not get with your other billionaire friends and say, hey, we can solve this, we can house people, we can get people mental health, we can get people drug treatment. You know, we get all these resources immediately, let's do it. How do you get people to understand the distribution of wealth is mm -hmm. imperative for all of us? Mm -hmm. when? coronavirus impact the black latino and asian community the most why don't these other people realize when you go to the hospital and it's crowded and you can't get your surgery because it's full of people with COVID 19 that affects you it all comes you know it's all it comes all around so i don't know how you get people to care about mutual aid because i think the people who care are doing their best to help the matter but but for some reason, politicians, mm -hmm. except myself, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and these people with wealth don't care. And, and I don't know how you get them to. No, just I guess you just keep on keeping on, just like you're, you're doing, Gloria. I mean, and pointing out the ethical and the moral imperatives, as you say there, right? I mean, that connects back to your earlier comments. Um, and teaching this lesson through all the different modalities that we can. I just love, for example, Heather McGee's new book, um, The Sum of Us, that highlights how doing things like draining a pool in, you know, in, in a community in St. Louis to keep the black kids from swimming in it actually hurts a whole damn community. Exactly, right? I mean, we are affected by the travesties and the devastations we see on our streets, right? Um, Cheatham, I want to get you into this conversation, right? Yeah, thank you, Ron. Um, and, and what a great segue, actually, from Gloria's um, ending comments about, you know, how do we make people care, right? And thinking about the morality and the ethics of uh, wanting and investing in a sustainable community, in a good community where people are happy, healthy, and safe. But th there's a flip side to that. And that is, of course, like not to, <laughs> not to suggest that morals and ethics are not important, but um, I would like to make the point that we should not rely on anybody's mercy to make sure that people in our communities have basic human needs, food, shelter, safety, access to health care, housing. These are basic human needs. And we really, it, it is my opinion that we should not rely on mutual aid to meet these needs. In case of emergencies, like it's amazing to see communities come together and support one another. Uh, but, but this is not something that we should do uh, on a continuous basis. Uh, in my sort of ideal uh, world, mutual aid is something there that uh, maybe, um, you know, 
stops a gap or mm -hmm. that um um you know maybe maybe add something extra mm -hmm. uh, like the little free libraries or you you know exchange your magazines that you're done reading or something like that but not really necessarily relying on one survival on uh the um you know kindness of others um of course we all need kindness of others but perhaps yeah. um we have better systems in place that can that can sustain our communities Thank no, you. no, I, I think that's 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 absolutely right. Um, we should not let our governments off the hook at all, right? And and just because we have our individual responsibilities to act ethically in relationship to our neighbors, it doesn't mean that we don't have a collective responsibility and that we shouldn't demand distributive justice from our societies. So, Gloria, right? Um, I want to get you back into this conversation because you lit it up here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to. Um, I also wanted to bring out a point that I got from the movie, and that is um, the desire in their redevelopment of that area to not gentrify it. Mm -hmm. They had one woman who um, sold African ingredients for food, and there was another woman who came to the store, and she's she's like, I drove twenty minutes to get here, but you know, she needed her ingredients. Mm -hmm. and I thought that was hilarious because in San Francisco it takes 20 minutes to find a parking spot but you know, <laughs> you know in the name of uh gentrification and redevelopment I have to go to Oakland just to get barbecue with sauce on it you know <laughs> I have to go to Oakland to get so many soul food um items and, and whatnot and and it's ridiculous you know and I just wanted to point that out that that should be in mutual aid that should be considered you know the woman with the tea shop she she um knew that so many communities drink tea you know and the different kinds from different countries and, and the, how that would be such a good idea for that neighborhood so i think that needs to be included with mutual aid to not think the great white hope can solve everything in redevelopment make everything shiny and look nice and bring in certain corporate stores, but to see what the community likes. And it's like, it's weird because in, in this city here, we we love going to eat. And it's, it's known for San Francisco being a diverse place to eat different types of food from different countries, but you can't find the ingredients here. You gotta go across the bridge to get them. All right. All right. Gloria, you are always welcome in Oakland. I'm as a resident of Oakland, as a proud resident of Oakland. You're always welcome here to get that that cue with the sauce. Okay. So, all right. So the next question I have for the panelists is about thinking of you know more globally, thinking in the bigger picture. Which communities have had have had have had to rely on mutual aid even way before COVID. I mean, COVID and the pandemic is really on my on our mind, and I'm definitely going to ask you a question about that. But you know, pre-COVID, um, which communities in in your experience have had to rely on on mutual aid? Um, and maybe this is an unfair question because the answer could be all of them, right? <laughs> so, Cheatham. Yeah, um, I'll start with uh, saying that minorities often uh, mm -hmm. relied on uh, mutual aid. You know, um, I'm a faculty member at a university. I was an international student at one mm -hmm. point. Um, I'm an immigrant. I was a new immigrant at some point. So um, as members of, um, you know, as sort of those communities myself, I relied on mutual aid at times, and I have observed my students rely on, observe, uh, rely on uh, mutual aid, especially for LGBTQ youth. Um, the the type of mutual aid that they receive sometimes are uh, sometimes is critical in their survival, in their happiness, in their finding their voice and their place um, um, in the world. Um, and I can say that as a college professor, where like I have observed that many times. You know, people need their village, and that village often comes with the element of uh, mutual aid. Uh, but um, yeah, in my case, my my experience, um, mutual aid has always made my life better. Uh, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't something like, um, you know, having access to food or things like that, but just additional things, you know, making life just a little bit better. Um, and, um, and so in that way, perhaps it's not reliance on uh, mutual aid. 
Um, in the example of the film in Dreamhood, in the story, we see mutual aid is um, is starting the main solution to the community, right? The community's issue, this blighted neighborhood, this struggling neighborhood. How can you fix it? The, essentially, there's this community leaders and groups come together and try to produce solutions and essentially find ways to re, uh, materialize, realize those solutions. Um, so I think uh, struggling communities often um, are the ones who rely, rely on community aid. Good, good. Mark, how would you answer the question? I'm not sure I could answer that really any differently. Uh, I would certainly underline a, a point uh, that Chenna Chen made uh, earlier, which is that mutual aid usually happens because a ball has been dropped. There's a gap somewhere in society, in community, in government, where this emergency mm -hmm. has been created. Um, so if you use that as a parameter for like, where mutual aid is, that's since the dawn of time. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I work for Shanti, and so my experience has been with the HIV positive community. That is a community that in the 80s, uh, already dealing with so many other kinds of um, stigma, you know, stigmatizing um, behaviors from people outside of the uh, LGBTQ community, had this disaster happened just mm -hmm. further. Um, stigmatize that community. Mm -hmm. So that to me is like my prime example of watching uh, as a young man at that point, uh, a, a community really try to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And then also realizing it couldn't do it on its own. Like mm -hmm. it was already facing trauma and a, and a community or an individual facing trauma support is required. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really the idea of other entities can come in, other communities, other individuals can come in and 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 support each other. So, yeah, I don't know if I have any specific answer as far as which communities uh, other than all communities, you know, mm -hmm. and I think the way to, to really look at that is to move back on, on a human level and realize mm -hmm. this is a, a human need. And so to get people interested in doing this, uh, you have to put human faces on mm -hmm. these challenges. They can't be uh, challenges where you're just going to feel like I'm going to be a do-gooder and, and help out. It has to be more coming from a place of humility and learning mm -hmm. um, where you want to to support something so that you can be enriched. Mm -hmm. No, that that's that's a deep answer. That's a deep answer because, um, you know, obviously, as Cheatham was saying, right, we, we uh, expect, uh, you know, communities devastated by neglect and devastation to respond with mutual aid efforts. Um, but we can't forget that we all have this connection together, right, in these circles of care. Um, and really, uh, um, yes, some communities are definitely needful, but we all need to get involved. And in fact, we all, in fact, need to be cared for at various times, right? So Gloria, how would you answer this question? Well, um, I feel that uh, there is some forgetfulness and mm -hmm. that um, the colonizers from Europe um, received a lot of mutual aid when they arrived here. The natives uh, taught them how to work the land, mm -hmm. uh, taught them about cleanliness mm -hmm. and preventing of diseases and whatnot, mm -hmm. and um, probably saved a lot of their lives with food and, mm -hmm. and, and just how to, the basic needs. and. Other than that, um, I think mm. forgetfulness to this day, you know, you saw the black officer at the Capitol yeah. save so many lives, you know, mm -hmm. um, immigrants, people who were brought here not by choice, uh, what have you, all have supported the labor levels in the this country mm -hmm. when it comes to even, you know, building the White House to, to all these tall buildings out here right now, you need to go to the desk and there's there's uh, usually a, a non-white person working there, you know, and being the first line of uh, information and safety and security for people. So mutual aid is being done both ways, all communities in ways some people don't even think of. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty much all I have to say on that. No, these invisible lines of mutual aid are very important. And again, back to the ethical, Gloria, right? We forget uh, the people that, that these issues 
aren't just, as someone said in one of our earlier programs, these issues aren't issues, they're people, they're lives, they're livelihoods, right? And we keep on forgetting that and treating them like, as Mark said earlier, like, you know, outcomes to satisfy so we can check off our assessment, our evaluation box. It's fantastic. So we only yeah, have a no, few no, more. Go ahead, Mark. It's just important to really point out, no person is a symptom, right? They're yeah. an actual person. They're not a symptom of a pervasive problem. And I think that's that's the trap that, un unfortunately, like many well-meaning, even, you know, progressives will, 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 will go to. They will look at a person, an individual or a community as a symptom rather than looking at all the different factors that actually make up that individual or community. No, that that's absolutely right. We, for, we drain the humanity of these things. We treat people like numbers, like, you know, check boxes. We get bureaucratic with them, sometimes for the sake of, of doing good, but then we just crush them. <laughs> All right, so we only have a few minutes left, and I want to give uh, the panelists the last word. Um, what would you say? Um, what would you say to the to the uh, everyone out there listening to today, right? About mutual aid, about our current situation, about the film, and you know, to make it even more difficult, about right how we recover from this pandemic. So. With that impossible question, Cheatham, what would you say? <laughs> um, you know, I will um, give an example uh, from the film. We, uh, one of the um, um, uh, people, uh, one of the people that we meet in the film, uh, she's the person who helps uh, sort of immigrants and refugees help figure out how to start businesses um, mm -hmm. in our economy. And she says in her interview, you know, in this day and age where we're so connected globally, everything can be done over the internet and, um, and which this circumstance actually has been really, you know, pushed to the max, right? During the pandemic, we're all connected via Zoom or what have you, you know, through other technology. Mm -hmm. She says, we have to remember that we have to walk out of our door and walk someplace, go mm. someplace, and that is your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so we still, no matter how we are connected uh, with uh, zeros and ones to one another anywhere, we still live on this earth in a place and taking mm -hmm. care of that place uh, and being mindful of that place, being mindful of the people in that place and being connected to them. I think uh, mutual aid is uh, a part of that, but I will, you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to remind us all that where we are, the place that we are in is so important. Um, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we feel that, you know, we're connected to our online friends and our social media and things like that. So just like to bring our attention back to um, our um, sort of bearings um, in a place. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. Yes, uh, you know, it's a it's a challenging time to say the least that we've been living in uh, recently. And I think during challenges, challenging times, uh, that's when people become more divided uh, from each other. And you know, differences are important. Differences certainly define us as individuals. They should be respected. Uh, they, you know, we should really be able to trot out our differences. But you know, commonalities are what define us as communities. They also are what define us as a species. So. Uh, being able to really see the human being in other people is essential. And it's, it's most essential during times of trauma, like right now. Um, so I think that'll be my parting uh, comment is that you're, you should always be looking for the, the human being and what you're trying to do. Beautiful, beautiful. Gloria. Yeah. Um, I just also want to just thank Cheatham for producing and directing the film Dreamhood. One of my favorite parts of it is something you said pretty much about stepping out and getting to know people is when the man from Pakistan said that he first picked up the Bible in an effort to help him learn English. And also he was skeptic of what it would say or whatnot, but then he transitioned to a part where even though it's not his religion, he wanted to learn about his fellow man and what their beliefs were. And I just think that that was, uh, uh, an epic part of the film and I believe it sums up to what we're saying is get to know people. Um, I encourage people to watch this film because I have faith that you can, everyone can learn something from this film. There's going to be something that stands out to you and, and hopefully it opens some hearts and some uh, compassion mm -hmm. and a, a, a urge to 
uh, participate in mutual aid. So thank you. All right. Thank well, you. Thanks, thank Gloria. you, Cheatham <laughs> Slankert and Gloria Berry and Mark Molnar and the audience out there. Thank you for joining us today. Check out these wonderful people uh, on the interwebs. And now um, back, uh, uh, back to Faye and Cristal. You're muted. Oops, I'm muted. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. You're thank welcome. you, Ron, and thank you to our esteemed panelists, Gloria, Tidem, and Mark. If you'd like to learn more, we've been placing links in the chat, and our full panelist bios are is in our website. Um, so now I'd like to let you know of our upcoming events. Um, so later today at 4.30 p.m., come back here uh, for our panel, how we mourn and where we remember. We'll discuss uh, monuments that are transforming in real time, our physical and cultural landscapes. That panel is moderated by Brian C. Lee of Design is Protest, Paper Monuments, and Co-Locate Design of New Orleans. Then let me tell you about the two events tomorrow, which is our last day of our festival, um, Sunday, February 21st. Um, the first event uh, is a in the early afternoon to 30 p.m. PST, um, the Museum of Hidden City panel discussion with um, creator Michael Epstein and a remarkable young poet, uh, Samuel Getachew, who wrote the script and narrated the augmented reality walking tour of the Fillmore. So if you not had a chance to do the walking tour, simply download the app on your phone um, and we will put the link to the chat where you can download the app take the walking tour of the Fillmore, and then come back tomorrow at 2.30 for the panel discussion. You have to sign up for the Zoom link for that one. But then our last event for the festival tomorrow afternoon at 4.30 p.m. PST is uh, Where the Pavement Ends. And the panelists include director of the film Where the Pavement Ends, Jane Galuli. And then also our special panelists include Tonika Johnson, creator of the Folded Map Project, uh, which um, speaks to the segregation that is in Chicago, and also uh, Brandy T. Summers, who's the author of Black in Par Place, and that's about gentrification in Chocolate City, or otherwise known as Washington, D.C. Um, and then a few last uh, announcements. Um, please, again, take a moment to fill out our survey. Uh, the link in this, is in the chat, and it really helps us understand who we're reaching and how we can make sure that we'll, we're serving our incredible and diverse audiences. And finally, if you enjoyed this afternoon's program, please share our festival and our um, news and tag us on social media at SF Urban Film Fest. Thank you again for joining us. See you at 4.30. Bye.